Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, it truly is a fun part of this job when you get to dust off a forgotten classic. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And, you know, if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to assume that you do, because, let's face it, you're listening right now. Uh, please subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. And give us the like. Give us the old five-star rating on your podcast provider of choice. We're pretty much everywhere. Places like Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Also, don't hesitate to check us out on social media. We're on the Facebook. We're on the Twitter. We're on the Instagram. We're on the TikTok. And we're on the Letterboxd for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In the Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because, you know, if we love to watch it and write about it and talk about it, we love it even more when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So do us the kindness and please pay us a visit. On this episode, we got a fun one. It is a blast from the past as we were going all the way back to 1981. For Dragon Slayer, which uh, has just recently been re released on uh, 4K and Blu ray, and it has never been better, is the story of a young wizarding apprentice who is sent to kill a dragon which has been devouring girls from a nearby kingdom. It's, uh, it was actually a Disney co pro with Paramount uh, Productions, and it, again, it's just it's a, it's a fun piece of fantasy, uh, a little bit of grit. It's got a little bit of grit under its uh, fingernails. It's it's classic 80s action adventure lore and i mean i absolutely loved it it was a formative movie for me growing up but uh, we had the unique pleasure of sitting down with the co-writer and director of the film mr matthew robbins in advance of it, it is its release on 4k and blu-ray which uh, again like i said go check it out is it in, it's in the stores now but so we talked with matthew about sort of the origins of the story making the film and just the the resurrection that it's had now, and him, you know, having kind of forgotten about the movie, but uh, being reminded during this whole press tour and just sort of with the re-release of the film about how he may have forgotten about the movie, but the fans have not. And uh, if you have not picked up your copy of Dragon Slayer, available on 4K and Blu-ray now from all major retailers, I do recommend you go do so. But first, enjoy our talk with Matthew Robbins, because between you and me, it is a darn good one. Obviously, Matthew, first off, man, just thank you so much for the time today. really appreciate this. It's my pleasure, Dave. It has everything in Toronto. Oh, plugging away. The sun is shining. It's getting warmer. We're not complaining. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, I mean, obviously, congratulations on the new re-release of, of Dragon Slayer with the 4K and the Blu-ray hitting stores imminently. But, I mean, I've got to ask. Walk me through, I guess, sort of the origins of, of the story and getting the film made, because something I had forgotten until I plugged in the disc and watched it again. And I saw that sort of that Walt Disney pictures and I remembered, I was like, yeah, Disney movies in the eighties had a little bit of dirt under their fingernails. And I mean, they were, they were a bit more, they were a bit more fun. Walk me through sort of the origins of getting Dragon Slayer made. Okay. Um, uh, Hal Barrow and I uh, were at USC together with George Lucas and we were, and still are very, very close friends. It's a little ensemble of us. Um, and, uh, uh, Hal and I were uh, very much around when George was creating ILM, uh, back in the days when it was still in Van Nuys rather than Northern California, and uh, with uh, John Dykstra and all this, all you know, the, the, the legendary origins of ILM. But we were there, and it became uh, apparent uh, in those first few years that it was all designed around um, uh, star fields and spaceships, and, uh, but, and we were around a lot. Uh, and we thought, well, why not use all that horsepower to do something else? And uh, so we cooked up this story, Dragon Slayer, and um, we um, wrote it and uh, our agent um, sent it out as they do to see if anyone would be interested. And there were, in fact, two studios that were interested not just Disney, but also Paramount. And uh, we got a call from the agent when he made this deal on our um, second uh, feature. 
uh, guys, we have news for you. Uh, it's going to be a co-production and it will be Paramount US and Canada and it will be Disney, the rest of the world. And so um, we had to uh, have meetings with both studios and both studios had different opinions as to who the cast should be, all this sort of thing. It was very tricky. And I, I, I look back on how we sort of navigated all of that and kind of head scratching how we actually went and survived it really because there were so many. And you know what was also going on uh, back then, uh, David, is that uh, there was this game uh, that had taken over the living rooms or the you know, bedrooms of kids all over the world was Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And, and Paramount um, um, uh, in those days had been trying to develop a movie about a dragon. And when we had some meetings there and I remember um, they showed us on the, somebody's desk, a stack of uh, scripts about dragons that they had tried to develop and didn't like. And here we came with ours, but Disney already sort of expressed interest. And so they, between the two studios, made this arrangement and so um does that <laughs> is that no, it, it, it does because it's it's one of those movies that i mean i always held dear in my heart and so many other people will held dear in their heart but at the same time there are elements about it where it was like oh yeah that happened or oh yeah peter peter you know peter would like i had forgotten peter was the lead in the movie mm -hmm. Like, can you walk me through sort of casting, especially sort of finding, I guess, this young Peter to 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 play this part? Yes, um, uh, the um, studios agreed that it should not be <clears throat> an entirely English cast. Disney was particularly emphatic about that. They felt in these pre Harry Potter days that it, right. uh, cast um, with English accents would be alienating. It would be too um, Tony, too. Uh, um highborn or whatever i they were just very very nervous about uh, uh an english movie uh, and yet we were not allowed to bring an entirely american cast all the way it was too expensive we couldn't so we were we knew going in we were going to have the mixing english and american actors and um uh what we loved about uh, peter mcnichol is um he was boyish and um he sounded mid-atlantic if I could, he, 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 we, we couldn't, we had uh, several interesting actors, but they sounded like they were from New York and uh, I, we couldn't deal with that. And uh, uh, so we had auditions and screen tests and everything else. And Peter just kept filling it. We checked off every box and he, he was gifted. He had a lot of presence and uh, just the right amount of a wide eyed, um, uh, unspoiled innocence and uh, because there's a love story uh, in, in the film as well we thought it would be very um, uh, touching to see a, a youngish person experience that uh, a, a kind of a first love in the midst of all this um, you know crazy fire and <laughs> fire breathing monsterhood for sure yeah. now i mean i've got to ask because this is something i've always been wanting to ask you because i mean i've been a fan of yours for a while and i mean i've enjoyed several of your films i always thought bingo got a bad rap by the way but i've always loved that movie but like what made you transition away from the director chair and focus more on writing particularly with people like guillermo who obviously you have a great relationship with um the truth is that in the whole uh panoply of things that go on about making a movie um i began to realize um almost unconsciously that it was more there was more freedom and more uh, excitement to me personally um unalloyed excitement in the writing uh, of, of original uh, material sometimes even adapting but uh, the, the the discovery process uh, uh of breaking new ground um just really um and and the and it, it's not easy to make a movie with um I came up through the studio system and there's this all these legends that you heard about so many filmmakers can begin to tell you how they you know suffer at the hands of the studio notes and the, the politics of the studio system and then i actually like working with actors i miss that that was a great pleasure uh because the actors uh have such uh, they have their the contribution they make to something you've written that's a real joy but on the other hand um, being the um, originator and the creator and and those those you know those first whatever it is three to six months when you're hatching a new story and staking out the territory on your own or with Guillermo or a partner like that and then the, the sheer liberty of it is uh, an unusual um, bit of uh, creation in the whole process 
of movie mm -hmm. making. I got to be very attached to it. Still am, actually. No, I mean, I guess that leads into my next question because obviously, you know, when the studio decides to remaster it and do a new release, like, are you are you pushing for that, or do you just get a phone call? Do you want to be a part of it? How does that whole process unfold? Uh, this was a big happy surprise. Um, uh, I never campaigned for it and never even thought about it. I just avoided seeing the movie whenever possible because I so hated the uh, original um, transfer to the VHS tapes. Right. Era, and then the DVDs were uh, probably worse. And, and, and it, it, it looked awful. It sounded awful. And when I went to festivals or uh, events, seminars, wherever, when Mr. Robbins were going to show your movie tonight, I wouldn't go. I would show up for the Q&A afterwards, but I just could not sit there because it made me look bad. It made ILM look bad. It made the whole thing look really cheap and fuzzy and, and grainy and and that. <laughs> so um, the fact that uh, a very enthusiastic group within Paramount, the, the people responsible for what you, you're seeing in this 4K, that group of artists and technicians, the men and women who were put who they campaigned to do this. They they were saying when are to the to the management, when are we going to do Dragon Slayer? They'd done a lot of other movies prior to this, but and finally the okay came down. It's my understanding what they told me when because I did, I was invited to go down. I live in Northern California to go down there. And I made several visits and sat in uh, on the video and audio sessions and, and, and saw and heard what they were doing. And um, yes, I took part, uh, but I can't say that I led the way because these are very sophisticated, very, very savvy viewers and listeners. And they knew that, you know, get rid of the grain in the skies, get rid of those mat lines, get rid of those garbage mats around the back of these people. You know, all this stuff was this visible, was like cringeworthy yeah. in the, in the um, original transfer. And now... It's really uh, come into its own. This is the you know, when you saw it on the big screen back in the you know in, in the, when it was released on the it was a beautiful movie and and uh, it was very I I mean, used to have to say that in these in these uh, Q and A sessions uh, you know uh, uh, apologize for my movie but that's not going to be necessary anymore. I'm happy to say. No, I mean I just got to put a bow on this because I mean you got to produce some special features and I mean I'm telling you. Guillermo was having fun on that commentary. Like in seeing this new transfer and seeing it out there for the world now, are you able to finally sort of appreciate what this film has actually meant to like so many generations, not just fans, but even filmmakers like Guillermo? I guess that's going to happen. I'm becoming aware of it in part today, talking to um, journalists like yourself, because I've been hearing. <laughs> I live in uh, Northern California, a little rural town, and I, 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 I just, I don't think I've been exposed um, to the online phenomena. I received word from Paramount a few weeks ago that it, the pre-orders on Amazon were astonishingly successful. It was a <laughs> pent-up demand after forty years. I know it's, it's, it's very gratifying, and I still haven't. I don't think I've really digested it because I'm only now you're watching me become aware of it. This is it. <laughs> so. Well, I mean Matthew, man, keep up the, you know, thank you for the work, keep up the good work, and thank you so much for the time today, man, I really appreciate it. Oh, no, my pleasure. I, I'm so pleased um, that um, <laughs> to, to be hearing this. I, I, I'm i doing uh, these um, um, sessions, and it's in part informing me that there really are uh, fans of this movie. I've not been in contact with this in so long that it's, it's really quite um, it's making my day. <laughs> well, it's going to be a fun ride. I hope you enjoy it. But again, thank you so much for the time. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.